Okay, hello everyone. Welcome to another episode. The title is Reality is Designed to be Engaged. And I wanted to speak about a very important point, uh, an idea in mysticism. <clears throat> and there's a quote actually from Swami Vivekananda. I would like to read for you. Swami Vivekananda says, Arise, awake, and stop not until the goal is achieved. And there's many yogis, many mystics, who talk about sincere effort surpassing <coughs> uh, ideological accumulation. But Anyways, the point uh, is effort, and effort is required for us to function in our outer realms. And what's interesting is that before a person, for example, moves their hand, or before I'm saying any of these statements, there is an effort within. That means it's as if something is moving before my hand moves and my hand's movement is like playing that part. You know what it is? <clears throat> it, I feel the brain is seeing itself do things and then fulfilling the role. As if somebody sees a cup of coffee in their inner realms, they have already seen themselves hold it and they just go hold it, you know? <clears throat> and how much the image of how the outer realms behavior syncs with the inner realm. I've experienced moments where I've been in, uh, in nature and when I've gone for a walk in nature, in my inner realms, I knew where to sit already. It's as if I saw myself walk and sit somewhere and I just went and sat there in nature. And there is something where I feel if we treat the human uh, intelligence as an antenna we will access uh, moments that have nothing to do with the antenna it's very difficult to define what being human is <clears throat> whether it's a phase the earth is going through <laughs> or whether it's uh, specific to us. Without the idea of anything surpassing the sensory perception, all of reality is bound. It's just bound in a certain range. And we know our sight, our visual sight, <clears throat> is a certain range of the electromagnetic spectrum. So our sight is like playing a few piano keys on a piano that has many keys. And it doesn't matter where you find yourself. If there's a piano in front of you, you should play it. If you find yourself human in a human world, <coughs> or in a world, you find yourself human in a world to be uh, where there is literally endless things to engage. <coughs> Uh, on this uh, planet, there should literally be no excuse for our boredom. Because there's so much stuff. Too much stuff. There's the story of Rumi and his mentor, Shams. <clears throat> but it, it's evidently in this story, it's the first time Shams is meeting Rumi. And Shams, Rumi is, is in his, uh, what was it, late 
<clears throat> he's in his late 20s, let's say, and uh, he's reading a book by a fountain. And Shams, the Sufi dervish, and this story is from like 700, 800 years ago. And Shams is this Sufi um, <clears throat> spiritual pilgrim, in a sense. It's, it was as if a lot of <clears throat> this was similar in uh, yogic, uh, a yogic context and also in a Sufi context. There were many traveling sages, like human beings that had found some sort of contentment with their nature. So it didn't matter where they existed, in what form they existed. They were just currents in some sense. <clears throat> but anyways, uh, Shams, um, this traveling spiritual man, he suddenly appears and he looks at Rumi, he, the Sufi, and he looks at Rumi and he says, what are you reading? And Rumi is the son of a duke. I don't know many people, if many people know this, but uh, <clears throat> um, he was the son of a duke and he had access to books and having access back in the day to a book, that was equivalent to like owning a Ferrari. <laughs> you know, or owning a Lamborghini or something. It's like, no way, this person has books in their home? It's like, nobody knows what a book is, nobody knows how to read yet. <laughs> and so Romy is reading this science book. This book at the time, I think, I don't know what the book was, probably something of you good. But anyways, he reads, he's reading this book and... Uh, the science book and Sham says what are you reading and he says it's a um, this is nothing you would understand old man carry on with your day <clears throat> as if like this dervish this guy with the big beard just out of the forest not like Tarzan but like dressed in <clears throat> you know pilgrim garb <clears throat> and he comes to him and he's saying what are you reading kid and Rumi just looks at him and he judges him his ego judges him <clears throat> And so when he says, not, you, it's uh, nothing you would understand, old man, you know, he took the path of arrogance. And Shams takes that book from his hand and throws it in a fountain. And two thoughts, first of all, Rumi instantly st stands up. It's like somebody who can't believe something, they stand up. <laughs> Have you noticed? <clears throat> so Rumi stands up from the fountain, two levels of shock. One level of, three levels of shock. One level of shock, he's judging himself, why did I sit beside the fountain? Second level of shock, oh my god, how, how, did, how dare this guy just throw my book into this water, <laughs> into the water of the fountain, you know? And third, oh my god, forget the book, forget my mistake, that was the only book and its ink's been diffused by the water and the book is destroyed. So the only science book <clears throat> was thrown in the fountain. It wasn't, there weren't photocopy machines back then. <clears throat> and so uh, Rumi looks at Shams and he says, do you know what you have done? You have destroyed the newest science of our time, the newest knowledge of our time. And this is where something strange happens that sets Rumi's life into a different path. <clears throat> Shams grabs the book from the fountain, gives it to Rumi as if the book is com the book is completely dry, as if it never fell. And he says to Rumi, knowledge that can be wiped with water is not real knowledge. And he leaves. As if he was a being that had an ability, just like how you rewind a film, he rewinded like the moment. <laughs> you know, he returned, like this is something where, like there's so many stories in mysticism <clears throat> about human beings who the, the material, uh, the physical realm has uh, listened to their soul. It's not often, but sometimes, <clears throat> you know. And I feel it's just uh, history's backup uh, backup system. The logos is kind of like as if a sort of unique history requires to be made, and we don't realize this earth it actually belongs to all human beings. This means all the human beings that were here before, all the human beings that are here now, and all the human beings that will come, as if it's one giant parking lot, and we're just coming and parking our cars, going shopping and coming back and then leaving the realm <clears throat> you know so so it, it's one of those things where our, our existence is occupying a space 
where in the future many people will exist and it's remarkable right now where I'm standing like I'm just in somewhere in Toronto but I'm telling you in I know every place every moment of this space-time continuum I've been sometimes I get a feeling who is going to come <clears throat> after and it's strange you know not when it comes to the inner realms you can't uh, it's not it's not testable in the same way as the outer realms that means an object sure we can touch it and notice it's real but a subject only our attention can touch until cyberspace and that's when we'll actually be living in our minds So, this quote by Vivekananda, Arise, awake, and stop not until the goal is achieved. When Rumi realizes between the two different types of knowledge, and knowledge that can be wiped with water, that means information that pertains to the temporary. And then, or I should say it in a better way, information, or I shouldn't say information, knowing, just knowing, that is conditional and that's what we call information and then there is knowing that is unconditional <clears throat> and unconditional knowing is a strange strange type of knowledge where if you were to um, <clears throat> if I was to give a, 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 I can't give an accurate statistic but if I was to say how many people have access to unconditional knowing <clears throat> uh, and they consciously know I would say maybe maybe the logos has uh, moved itself in 30% of the population directly. I feel 30% of human beings on this planet are not living as human beings. They're living as presence. It's an evolution of an object that was being a subject and now is asking what next. And that is the most profound question. I honestly don't care <clears throat> for, I have, I have look, uh, looked over so many different ideological systems and there's so many more still to look at <clears throat> that my ultimate conclusion is that it is we have to use uh, in the inner realms access on conditional knowing. In the, out, in the outer realms, we require to respect the human initiative. As if what we are, our species, our existence, whatever story you say, that means it doesn't matter if it's secular, if it's non-secular, both care for human beings. They don't care with the same reasoning, but at least, you know, our most ideological systems, because they need human beings to be alive. Think of it this way. <clears throat> A human being uh, needs uh, shelter to survive and ideas, they need minds to survive. So in order for an idea to pass down to the generations, it has to enter the mind of that person. Now the issue with, let's say, heavy ideological systems and light ideological systems, now we're living at an era where every ideological systems are light because the internet set us free. Because globalization of information made us see multiple angles to the same moment, so we can't just be convinced by one angle. <clears throat> so technically, light ideological systems. But back in the day, they were heavy. Let me tell you what I mean by heavy. That means the ideological system would occupy the person's life. That means it would be as if this is, this would, this is like, <clears throat> okay, this is an example of ideological possession. <clears throat> A person... Uh, a child, let's say, um, it is. It comes from a lineage of blacksmith. Okay, different blacksmiths. Um, you know, and the person's father, grandfather. Uh, you know, their great 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 grandfather. They were all blacksmiths. A line of uh, blacksmiths where the person's last name is Smith. Okay, <clears throat> and so let's say this Mr. Smith is. <laughs> Is looking for Neo. No, I'm joking. <laughs> now, now let's say <clears throat> this Smith, uh, this child that has been born in a lineage of blacksmiths, 
right? This child has to choose, and let's say this child somehow, even though all the whole time he's there with his beside his father, you know, seeing how his father, let's say, is <clears throat> making, you know, swords or <laughs> This, this kid eventually, let's say suddenly, as he's walking in town, he's the son of a blacksmith, but suddenly he hears, let's say, music for the first time. That means his whole time, and he remembered, let's say, the whole time he was there hearing his father, um, let's say, build the sword, hammer the sword, he was hearing the sound of the hammer, as if that was what his intelligence was tuning and extracting or finding significance in the moment. And then let's say this kid in his, you know, um, uh, one day there where he doesn't have to be an apprentice in his father's, I don't know, blacksmith shop. <laughs> This kid suddenly, let's say, goes and plays an instrument and suddenly realizes he's a prodigy in music or something, right? <clears throat> and he knows his value. He knows that he can do something <clears throat> that in uh, other angles of reality is very hard. Somebody once said the way the system of the, the, this realm, at least when it comes to <clears throat> uh, uh, competitive capitalistic and democratic systems, Right. Even though it's democratic, it's as if like <clears throat> language is um, interfering always. And what that means is when someone tries to succeed in civilization 1.0, this current system, they will eventually reach a point where everyone will tell them what they're doing is impossible. Why? Because when we attempt the new, it is not just scary for the explorer, it is scary for what it's going to imply to the, the old way we held the world, the previous way we held the world. <clears throat> so this child has to go and, be, and uh, in some sense learn the blacksmith trade, okay? <clears throat> to be in some sense to be able to teach it but then dedicate his life to the music that is calling him you know in this life I, I don't believe you know it's it, it makes sense to think that a university an institution can justify um, the psychology of a lifetime <laughs> There is no monopoly on knowledge, but there is an, uh, um, in, in the inner realms, in the outer realms there is. In the inner realms, two people seeing the same event, they have knowledge. So that means you can have, <clears throat> let's say, a very bad person or a very good person <clears throat> or a very, let's say, uh, higher class person or a very lower class person, <clears throat> you know. And yet they could notice the same event. Let's say you had a, you know, all these different um, classifications in society all watching a volcano erupt. As if the knowledge of that event surpasses all the hierarchies of classification. In the, when you see something, it becomes a part of you. <clears throat> That's just the way reality is designed. That means even before me saying reality is designed to be engaged, <clears throat> or that the human being should have an effort to engage reality. <clears throat> we are designed to respond to stimulus. Now, consciousness means we input the stimulus in our own environment, and that's what familiarization is. When I uh, consider what is the meaning of life, a question many people usually say don't touch. Many people say don't touch the question. <clears throat> what is the meaning of life? Why are we here? But I feel the reason they're saying don't touch it is because no one has understood how to touch it. <clears throat> Eyes appear in a world. As they move in the world, 
they take the shape of a self. As they take the shape of a self, the brain, I mean, what does the child's, uh, the infant's brain do? <clears throat> you know, the infant is born not having psychology, not having an ego, not having an identity, not having a sense of self, yet there is a being there. <clears throat> you know, and the being with the body is individual, but how do we know that beyond individual or body, we are space? How do we not know that our being has to do with space and the human being, the human part, has to do with what's in this space. Because my mind has never been an object. <clears throat> and when I realize this, <clears throat> I realize we cannot localize abstraction to itself. That means I'm looking at a coffee cup right now, but um, uh, where the idea of a coffee cup is, it's not local that I could just grab the <clears throat> Let's say I thought about like, <clears throat> I don't know, a samurai sword <clears throat> glow with a blue glow, okay? Let's say I imagine this. <clears throat> now, it doesn't mean just because I imagine this, I can grab this samurai sword. But, how is my mind seeing something in the room? The sages would say, there's two things you can do in life. You can either trust it or distrust it. It doesn't matter <clears throat> what format you find it in. But ultimately, when you trust the moment, the life force evolves, advances. When you distrust the moment, <clears throat> it's, it stops. So distrust is pressing the gas pedal. <clears throat> uh, excuse me, distrust, <laughs> distrust is pressing the brakes trust is pressing the gas and in any system that a person trusts they add momentum to it you know that means a human being can't be alive and not notice its own life and before even uh, uh an acceptance of the idea of death that means i can't accept the idea of death death until i figure out what life is That means it's like, how can we be sure? <laughs> Guys, there's five likes, but one viewer. This is like the spookiest episode. <laughs> And you know, our sense of self is from the world. So when we engage the world, it is like the world is engaging itself. <clears throat> and our individualism is a mirage in, in the desert of our collective being. You know, that means life, how much of it moves beyond personality. <clears throat> that means how much of uh, intelligence in the moment of being, of the human being, how much of it has nothing to do with everything we know.
reality's meaning, its purpose comes with engagement. <clears throat> and when it comes to trust and distrust, that's a binary system. So that means if we took away all human ideology, all names, all personalities, and we're going to judge people of what they did, it would ultimately be how <clears throat> how they used, how they were being an expression, and how they wielded their self-expression. That means back in the day, uh, you know, warriors had swords and shields. Now we don't have swords and shields, but we have the observed and the observer. We shield ourselves from systems by stepping out of them. We go on the offense when we engage systems. And if all of life, it can be summed down to effort or no effort. That is what it would mean. If language wasn't here, all of the meaning of life, our fascination, <clears throat> would just silently be witnessing how, our, uh, how efforts continue. That means life is like you're a battery. And you can use this battery to be self-entertained. You could use this battery to contribute to your civilization. Or you could even use this battery to contribute to other dimensions. That means it's hilarious that there are some, <clears throat> not many, but there are some human beings that are not, they're living on Earth, but they're not living for Earth. They're living on Earth, but not for the Earth. They don't, they, that means they have forgotten, <clears throat> how do I say When the self is important, the world is in the passenger seat. When the world is important, your sense of self is in the passenger seat. I will encourage human civilization to put the world in the driver's seat. And many people will say, no, just live for yourself. Screw the world. The world won't understand you. The world is behind. The world is cruel. <clears throat> the world is filled with fools. The world is this. The world is that. So many ideological systems inspired by our current cultural programs are trying to glorify avoidance and ignorance. That means what's worse than being ignorant is glorifying that ignorance so that the future generations stay ignorant too. That means if a person wants to be ignorant, that is their choice. But if they want to create an ignorant system that influences the future generations, who says you get to choose for the future? So there is injustice in the system. But this injustice, sometimes uh, it's as if the person went to <clears throat> fight an enemy and then noticed that the enemy is actually destroying itself. So uh, believe it or not, many people may not realize this. If they just live for a better world, they will not be caught in the games of the previous one. That means you might not believe sometimes the easiest way <clears throat> to transition out of moments is also to not engage. That's something I didn't understand when I was young, so I, I got into a lot of fights. <clears throat> that means most people don't realize language is not them. So when you say, let's say something in language that gives, makes their own image to themselves different, and if the person gets emotional, that's a human being that is still possessed by a story. Rather than realizing we are beyond stories, there is an energetic presence of attention, and then there is the ability to use stories, have stories, and whatever, right? <clears throat> The issue is we're unconsciously being language. Now we need to consciously be language and then uh, 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 there is an advantage of multidimensionalism that just comes from witnessing our own life.
and really what is what is the way uh, forth for human beings everyone has a unique design different DNA we find ourselves on a rock in the middle of nowhere before uh, our eyes opened many human beings had set forth various different kinds of systems so we've pretty much opened our eyes in a story <clears throat> that in midway through a novel so consciousness emerges in the middle of a novel that is so big that it cannot know the beginning of the novel and it cannot know the ending of the novel yet how we live is suggesting <clears throat> how the no novel is being written and how it will be written that means human beings cannot know the future but they can know that moment where from the present it goes into the future There's many moments in life where <clears throat> the universe doesn't owe you an explanation. That's one of the first things I realized from the unknown. <clears throat> I realized my mind can't be defined with anything I refer to, to my body. Because if I defined my mind as my body, there would be no mind. That word would be obsolete. And the only reason we don't uh, say the mind is a second body <clears throat> you know is because we are noticing it is completely different than the body the mind is an access to space the body is an access to matter <clears throat> and if the mind if intelligence is from the space it's as if, imagine there was a sort of consciousness, imagine, that was like gas. So imagine in the future, nanotechnology gets so advanced. <clears throat> imagine you're like Sherlock Holmes and a detective, and you're like in a hallway running away from the bad guys, and then you're like, okay, time for nanotechnology. You press a button, and you add your whole consciousness, and everything turns into steam. You turn into gas, and as gas, you leave the building. You know from like <clears throat> the air conditioners <laughs> so I'm saying like it's one of those things where imagine a consciousness that is like air and so if air goes inside the lungs or if it's outside of the lungs does it really change what the air was if the consciousness is from the air <clears throat> right so it could be that um, um, we are literally driving this dimension we're driving a 2d life from a 3d life <clears throat> and we don't notice the mind is the brain is so advanced and it's so weird how it's just uh, emerged that means it's hilarious we needed brains to, ha to have psychology emerge but we needed psychology to name the uh, concept brain <laughs> And whenever you have the concept of emergence, then that is the most abstract and bizarre idea that anything can arise or a thing can just arise. That means philosophically why there should be yeah, even a here and now. Why? Why should the universe be here? How many people are grateful that there's a universe here right now on the planet? How many people notice that, that they are uh, <clears throat> jumping uh, from the sands of the hourglass as it's falling? From each sand, imagine leaping to the next.
awoke from the unknown and we will in some sense <clears throat> enter uh, fall back into sleep into the unknown as well our whole life is just based on the emergence of psychology <clears throat> in the moment that means how your attention opens up to the moment and if you have found the freedom unborn unborn freedom <clears throat> a freedom that was here before we were a knowledge that was here before we were a truth that was here before we were and pretty much if there was something here before we were that means life totally transcends the human idea and we are just a play in the void we are just a Shakespearean uh, <clears throat> Uh, lang giant language event. So, I guess I gotta pour out <clears throat> moments of my effort. <laughs> um, first thing about effort a person should know is that um, <clears throat> if you're afraid to be a fool, you'll never see anything that, and other than what you're seeing right now. So if, if a person can't be a fool to themselves, they won't learn from themselves. So human beings have to become comfortable in any experience that happens to the human being. Imagine, <clears throat> this is the advanced communicator. I see this in the future generations being like this, where they no longer have like suffering and like happiness in the same way we're treating it for them they're just like okay how many archives uh like in my in my uh, they will treat their minds like a database of different states of mind they have experienced <clears throat> that means it's as if like we are treating it as memories but memories are actually states of mind are they not they're just states of mind where they are residue of past real states of mind so the human psychology is filled with examples of itself <laughs> how hilarious is that it's like right now i'm speaking and i'm i'm creating <clears throat> uh, not just creating i'm like this moment is becoming a memory and then tomorrow i'm gonna let's say wake up and give a talk and that talk is gonna be another memory and so literally it's memory creation it's memory accumulation that means what is going on is that sensory perception <clears throat> is timelessly hitting our eyes then based on us journeying in the realm being a moving <clears throat> force uh, leaving behind a breadcrumb breadcrumb trail of inner events <clears throat> and I can't I can tell you uh, very uh, firmly that a person can become like a bird uh, and they can close their eyes and they can fly over the whole forest of their mind. That means the moment you conquer uh, not uh, being a fool, that means whenever the human being, whoever you are, and the easiest way is to do something consciously foolish <clears throat> and then <laughs> and then just 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 acknowledge, okay. I have seen what the fool's eyes have seen. Now time to see all that remains beyond the fool's eyes. That means it's like experience. <clears throat> um, uh, that means when you fall down, the only thing you can do is get up. Really. Even gravity will be like, yeah, man, yeah, yeah. <laughs> My inspiration of effort was that I became a fool, then I tried to get out of being a fool, then I realized there is no way out. 
<laughs> that means whatever we do on a rock in the middle of nowhere is playful self-creation until unconditional direct experience begins to do, speak in you on the planet <clears throat> this is the work of the advanced communicators not all human beings are here to serve the body of civilization some human beings are here to serve the mind of civilization and if we can build an advanced civilization when you're young you build the civilization when you're old you build the mind of the civilization <clears throat> so there has to be this idea that um, <clears throat> literally the concept of uh, you know, it's like before university uh, human beings must look at their universe and then great questions will walk to them and when these great questions walk to the human being then they will understand why knowledge is necessary what that means is if, if a person doesn't know they're in a battle and you give them a sword and a shield, they'll be like, what is this? Why am I doing this? You know? <laughs> but the moment they realize, they, they go and they realize like an army is charging at them. <clears throat> and let's say this is like an ancient war. <clears throat> so in that case, the person, it's, you will instantly understand why they have the sword and shield. Okay, The moment life gets instant, in, in, intense, let's say in the future our species is so linguistically obsessed that if an advanced alien civilization, uh, let's say uh, with, a, uh, with a cruel incentive, <clears throat> uh, comes and wants to manipulate human beings, all it has to do is change human language. That's how, how easy we are to manipulate. And so imagine at what level we have to be to be able to have at least a firm defense against interdimensional interference. <clears throat> you know, and it's no longer a point where we're wondering if the multidimensional is there or not. Everything points to it. You go look at language. Anybody who speaks a language. Okay, go look at the dictionary of that language. Go look at the words of that language. You're going to see each word has multiple meanings and can be used in multiple ways. The language, what we're using to tell ourselves a story is a multidimensional tool, right? But in the outer realms, we're like, no, we're just this one person, yeah, and we judge based on that. It's as if the body is lying to the mind, and the mind is lying to the body, and we're like, why are they lying to each other? And we're like, oh my god, they're not lying to each other, they're in different rooms. So if the person can fathom how if nothing happens, nothing happened. That's the good thing about nothing happening. <coughs> Let's say that's at least one thing, right? <coughs> As if like, because in, the, the, in any action a person does, even me giving this talk, I never, like a person can never know. A person can never know the moment they it's like some some artist said the moment you give your artwork out to the world it's no longer yours and why because every human being's eyes will extract it differently so based on how many viewers this talk has that's how many different types of this different parallel ways this talk has been heard that means every viewer that hears this talk is adding a parallel universe to this talk. done well for animals, but we have not done well for human beings, for the human being and its limit is unknown. And as much as I think about how many types of tragedies may occur on this earth, and how many problems may like a monster suddenly, you know, <clears throat> you know, growl in the streets, I know that at the same time, nature has a law of balance at work. And so it's as if 
if there's more cruel people, the counter nature will come. So as many, as much as people think like the future has no hope, we have no idea what kind of pilots and advanced communicators are gonna land on this plane in the next 20, 200 years. <clears throat> and now slowly the global arena is allowing personalities from different national <clears throat> identities to emerge, right? And so what we're beginning to see that ultimately whatever human performance it is, it is human. And I feel what's going on is that globalization is birthing a new language of experiential human decency. Where we're realizing that the human being is as mysterious as its interpretation of the world than its choices are that interpretation of the world. in a hospital uh, and I have a twin brother my twin brother uh, came to that hospital I felt sick after the thing <clears throat> and there was a doctor who was injecting me with the needle and this doctor couldn't get the needle in to a point where my brother my twin brother was there and the doctor is trying like <clears throat> imagine 10 times to get it in you know and it was this very strange moment where it's like after after a point in life where it goes beyond your control, all you can do is just be the watcher of your own. The sense of self constantly changes, and as long as the world can update, how can there be certainty? How can we uh, have? A, 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 how can we find truth in a changing system? That should be the question <clears throat> for all truth seekers. And everything in the universe that has content changes. So if somebody claims a truth, it's going to change. Claims a subject, it's going to change. If they claim an object, it's going to change. And the more they're closer to the known. But if someone claims an unknown subject, this is the power of the unknown. It passes the test of time. <clears throat> I feel the only force that can pass the test of time. And ultimately, it's just the will of nature. It's as if the person at the end of their life, they're like, okay, I tried something, but ultimately, you know, the planet knows what it's done. <clears throat> so the person just, you know, puts their palm on the earth and it's like, you got this earth. And then, you know, bah, they, go. <clears throat> they shoot into <clears throat> the next, you know. <laughs> I 
I would say there is so many ways of um, containing the world. There's so many ways of seeing it as a concept and in a certain context, and you can sometimes see the concept change quicker than the context, or the context change quicker than the concept. If a person doesn't put conscious effort in their life, at least in some dimension of their life, <coughs> That means if you if you couldn't, um, it's like if you can't pilot in the conscious waking state. How does the person expect the conscious and unconscious states? How to pilot in? Excuse me. How to pilot in unconscious states? This life has to be used as training for multidimensional remembrance. And effort is the ultimate conclusion. That means it's never about rational or irrational. And let me tell you why. Because a person could have had any sort of starting point. So when it's like Texas Hold'em and human beings are being given different cards, being dealt to different hands, ultimately it comes about how well you see what's on the table <clears throat> and what you do with your cards. This is an incredible metaphor, yeah. What we do with our intelligence is like what we do with the cards that have been given to us. The world has gifted us something. It has gifted us its presence. <clears throat> the cool thing about design and geometry and the moment I realized this, I've been saying it, and a lot of my work <coughs> centers around geometry's role in civilization. But I would say, the moment I realized shapes have nothing to do with thoughts, outer shapes. <coughs> they, have, they may be images, but I'm saying like the shape, like why <coughs> uh, 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 a cup, you know, has a circular edge. That shape has nothing to do with why I'm calling it a cup or why it's subjectively a cup. That means the outer realm, <clears throat> it's like what is 2D is 2D, what is 3D is 3D, but when the 3D looks at the 2D, it's still seeing through 3D, you know? So this is, a, this is the view, kind of like how in the Lotus Sutra, they say the Buddha at the end of his life, he went into hysteria and he's like, oh my God. And, and, and his disciples are like, what is it, Buddha? Why now? And Buddha's like, I just realized I have been mistaken. Everyone has been enlightened from the beginning. This means the belief in the illusion is the illusion. And when all perception can be rendered as just shape, moving shape. <clears throat> because the simplest way is this whole life is just something, it's it's an event. It's like what it's not even like a philosophy. <laughs> this life is just and it's something is taking place and we're trying to see how alive it is and how how much we can access the life of the universe. <clears throat> and we access it immediately through ourself, the human being that we have <clears throat> been uh, learning from the first human being. That means the man in the mirror was my first teacher. My first guru. <laughs> it's like, hey man, this guy comes from a lineage of gurus. It's like, yeah, with the guru the past guru, it's himself in the mirror. <laughs> and it's, he's just put two mirrors in front of it, so it's, he comes from a lineage of endless self-reflected gurus in the mirror. You know? <clears throat> the effort of your life doesn't have to only be contained in idea. And I'm 
just trying to say direct experience is, is a horse that those who care for can ride. We can say, we can even classify the dimensions of life. Let's say the purpose of life is just effort. <clears throat> now, this effort has become a velocity. That means it has a certain direction and a certain speed. So, our effort in this life can be directed, that means we can choose the destination, we can choose the point to go towards, and we can choose how fast or how slow we go towards it. Now, let's say there was an effort, and let me bring in the traditional, <clears throat> let's say just like we have solid liquid gas, we have body, mind, soul. Okay. So, <clears throat> let's say there's an effort of the body. So when I would think about the effort of my body, okay, where is it gonna, where is my body going to exist? How is it going to exist? You know, it's like with what speed am I going to live with this body? <clears throat> and where is this body going? And the realizations I've gotten, and Buddhism helped me out with this, is that the body is going to emptiness and its speed is the only thing you can control that means ultimately the direction of biological existence is back into the earth you know <clears throat> it, it's like it's like there were more there should have been more lines to that drake song you know we started from the bottom uh now we're here then we're going to go back to the bottom <laughs> it's like evolution oh my god you know are dying so that the future generations can live. It's incredible how life is happening. Literally, it's like we're all renting life force. It's like it's like space is endlessly playing with a planet as a civilization. Guys, this inspired uh, probably tonight. I'm going to talk about it. Um, space is playing um, with the Earth as a civilization. <clears throat> we are looking at it from a human angle, but if we looked at it from the universal angle, you know, it's like our humanity is just the tip of the iceberg of our totality. These efforts, uh, we call that survival. <laughs> the mind's effort, we call that purpose. And the soul's effort, we call that realization. So if a person can live a life where survival is a priority, purpose is a priority and realization which ultimately means we are a creature that has the potential to understand so before it is dismissed out of the realm it understands it wonders about what it's standing under <clears throat> an endless sky i'm literally talking here to to the audience in a world where we have an endless sky we have an endless sky and we're like oh my god reality is only in this narrative it's an endless sky. The sky doesn't exist. The earth is the sky of the sky. <laughs> <clears throat> so.
So when reality is taken to a com can be seen on a completely geometric design existential level, it has nothing to do with being human and emotions can disengage. That means the less you uh, are identity in, in a humanized space. <clears throat> so I'll give you an example. Let's say uh, in the future, um, you know, <clears throat> kids are lonely and the parents are like, oh my God, my children. You know, they're lonely, let me buy them robot friends. And they, they like order like 10 Android friends. And imagine there's a child who is surrounded by robotic friends. And imagine there's a child who is surrounded by real human beings with unknown variables and uniqueness and uh, mind probability generation, you know? <clears throat> so what is the, the robotic environment? Behavior is, mechanic, is, is repetitive. In another way, it's, it's varied. That means people think that they have to be just fixed shapes in front of one another. You know, solid Tetris species falling into the right spot 24-7. <clears throat> I don't believe that's the case. The idea is to actually realize what, what is beautiful about being human is our spontaneity. That is our greatest gift. Our, our, our multidimensionality of our inner realms allows us in the middle of doing one activity, thinking of another activity and doing that. That is spontaneity. That is leaping from inner realm events. <clears throat> or you can be, let's say, let's say, I don't know, let's say like, like Clark Kent is uh, biking to work and suddenly, you know, <clears throat> uh, see somebody do something cruel and he destroys his bike and just like flies into the sky emotionally. <laughs> Clark Kent is in the outer realms. Clark Kent sees <clears throat> a crime. Superman from the inner realms, you know, gets rid of his coat. <clears throat> you know. And you know, there is something mysterious about Superman, where Superman, unlike the other <clears throat> heroes, doesn't wear a mask. So when he goes to work, he's not like Spider-Man going to work. <clears throat> and so people can notice who he is. And I think the reason in the, sh in, in the comic, nobody acted, nobody said it there, like, oh my God, it's Superman. If we say we know who he is, he's gonna like, <laughs> who knows what's gonna happen. You know what I mean? Like, <clears throat> It's, it could be out of fear they were being nice to <laughs> oh, man. Anyways, the effort of the body, keep it going. The effort of the mind is exploration, discovery. That's the greatest purpose. I mean, what ultimate purpose can we have when we don't know anything as, as creatures on a rock? So. You know, it's like all of knowledge is, is you know, self-glorification of work. True knowledge is, uh, we have to build systems. Literally, we need a global network of designers <clears throat> to build a culture of endless self-sustaining reinvention. That means, can you imagine a civilization where its 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 success rate, its advancement was so high that whatever mistake human beings made would be nothing. And so human beings would, in some sense, be way more fascinated on being at the front, being the captain of the ship of human civilization, and experiencing that mode <clears throat> rather than just being carried. Because when a person is being carried in life. Um, they become absent of their own potential in life. But at the same time, due to the temporary nature of the realm, a person has to use whatever they are somehow.
if we find a collective purpose, we will create an atmosphere where not from a demo democratic view, it's gonna be the best view in accordance to just what views are out there. I mean, sometimes I look at political systems and I'm like, what are people doing? Voting, <clears throat> uh, like in the future, you can totally imagine, like in, in the year 2050, Ray Kurzweil, this futurist, uh, it says that there's going to be a technological singularity, so machines are going to update quite faster than us. We can control it. <clears throat> so these machines, um, imagine now they come and take our jobs. And imagine we're like, no way. They took all our jobs. And we're like, no way. They took even the job of the president. So imagine an AI comes. And uh, in, in the future, you can envision this AI just showing policy probabilities to human beings. And human beings just collectively cherry pick. So that means everybody's vote gets counted. The AI comes up with a, a, a political system or a sort of a, a resource ma management and allocation that surpasses what a human psychology could do, right? So I'm saying if the future is heading that way, it's as if people perhaps should start voting for, we should create systems where policy can be decided on, not people, because for politicians, it's not easy being under that weight. You know the weight of just the whole world you know uh, you know constantly at you so so there is some, there is something there where it's 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 like I could totally see the inspiration right because the more people act savage the more it's as if uh, the political mindset it's like look at these savages like so that, so that mentality that mentality doesn't help in some sense and it should be uh, a, a platform for the communication of minds that means it doesn't matter where you are uh, uh, in a hierarchy uh, in a system it, it's as if like there, there's always shadows to the system that means it doesn't matter if you are in in the in, in the lowest level or the highest level you know so these two levels each have a shadow the shadow of the lowest level is the dissension into violence, right? <clears throat> the savageness of the higher levels is the dissension into inner realm violence, which is injustice. And so injustice, and they both backlash. They both suddenly, it's like you can't press a piano key and not expect to hear a sound. A person can't do something violent and not expect the world to respond to it somehow. <clears throat> you know, that means it's as if this is where it comes, the caution, and especially for human psychology, it, where I'm saying people should teach uh, 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 these terms to people. You know, I call it the inner realm and the outer realm. And so imagine, like, people realize when their inner realm is not their outer realm, so whatever justification for their behaviors, uh, authorization they had based on their inner realm doesn't actually get through in their behavior in the outer realm. So the person is actually using their consciousness, um, unlike animals who are just being carried by their environment, by the stimulus of their environment, right? The human being is using their consciousness to actually filter their emotional insta choices from, from what is actually going on in the outer realm event. That means just like you take off your hat when you go get go indoors, it's a sign of courtesy. Similarly, <clears throat> I don't know, maybe for rappers, culture it's changed, but <clears throat> but if you're if if you when you take off your hat, now imagine you take off your inner rums. You know, this is something where it's as if um especially um when I communicate to people, I like deep down I know that um, their my eyes are just a certain range of perception. So ultimately, listening becomes fascinating. You know, it's as if listening. There's the imagine you don't have the concept of listening. You you just have the concept how are different eyes looking at the world. And then when people speak, every every person who speaks, you want to instantly listen and be like, how's this person looking at the world? What angle do they have access to that uh, my perception is not yet seen? <clears throat> and this is so crucial. You know, I'm saying that um, uh, we must aim for an efficiency and a synchronization of the body's life with the mind's life, and based on uh the, the 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 how the free will functions in a structural system then the person's gonna feel like on a soul level okay my life was okay <laughs>
I feel um, if we build an advanced civilization that acknowledges these four dimensions I call Ring of Naps and Heaven, zero, one, two, and infinity. <clears throat> zero, I'll start with this. We open our eyes in the dualistic dimension. That means everybody listening to me right now as a, as a person in, in a cultural program, are speaking in uh, the two dimension. We are literally all my conversation and my language and the linguistic simulation, it exists as one fourth of the world. So language is only one fourth of reality, of what is actually uh, uh, intelligence as possible. Now, some people, they go towards uh, let's say spiritualism in the context of union for example the word yoga means union the union of what the individual activity with the collective activity and the moment you realize their inseparability the, your relationship with the planet shifts from a self-claimed conceptual one to a more watching how if there is a mind what is it doing that should be a fascinating and a welcomed question by the civilization. <clears throat> so um, all of language and communication and knowledge for now, actually, I'm not going to say communication, but language is in, uh, communication is like the, the communicator is the user of technology, language is the technology. <clears throat> language is what we're driving to be individuals. Imagine behind your eyes, there's like a linguistic NASCAR race. No, just... <laughs> Yoga takes that inseparability, that union, make, takes people to the one dimension. This is where some people either uh, they think their inner realm is the only totality or the outer realm is the only totality. So this means all those people who believe reality is not like a self in a world and it's like where the imagination of the gods or God based on <clears throat> where you're born. So we have, um, let's say, um, various percentage of the human population functioning in the one dimension these are human beings where i would say if tomorrow somebody said hey would you want an advanced civilization where everybody's the same and everybody's one and we're like drops of water on a windshield that have become one giant you know uh, puddle <clears throat> you know so it's it's as if it's like would you want that and i would say uh the religious and all those who have come to some sort of union and unconditional being of a uh, sort of oneness of being, whether through in yoga there's uh, of, of four paths, uh, uh, bhakti yoga, the path of love, karma yoga, the path of war, raja yoga, the path of knowledge, and janani yoga, the path of meditation. <clears throat> so through these paths, you may come across bhakti yoga gets to oneness the quickest first. So back to yoga, love gets you to the one dimension very quickly. But it doesn't get you to the infinite dimension and it doesn't prepare you for the void either. It prepares you to be the same though. So all those people who experience oneness, they will also be in an experience where they will feel space. This is the strange concept where if you, um, from the Abrahamic lens, <coughs> it would be a, <coughs> from the Abrahamic lens, it would be, God is everything. And if God is everything, nothing is a part of everything.
So if knowledge, if 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 nothing, if God is everything, you know, and nothing to us is being conceived. <clears throat> so in some sense, nothing is a part of everything. Let's say even a metaphoric everything, a total, an absolute everything. <clears throat> So in oneness, there is no self, there is no world. It's like you are, you are, you are. <laughs> in, du in dualism, in, in duality, you can, you, are, you can be anything you want. That's different. But in oneness, you are. That means it's like, it's like it, you, there is no talking about like oneness human rights. You know? <laughs> you know, there's no collective being rights. You know, that idea can't exist. That means if we were truly advanced uh, creatures on this wrong, uh, on this rock, we wouldn't even need law. That means if we wouldn't need the perfect law or like the thing, we would be advanced enough to realize now that we, after 4.5 billion years of evolution, we've evolved to to the platform of intelligence, to the platform of minds, and having such a complex, you know, again advantage of society and civilization. This this has to be used. Right. So if a person is in like, here's the thing, here's the idea. If none of this was here, it would be way easier to say anybody could do whatever they want. But because all of this stuff is here, because this is like remnants of some, you know, echoing Aeonian science project is going on. If we ignore our present, we have dishonored our own ancestors that got the present here. So let's say you go beyond oneness. What does that mean? What is there to go beyond oneness? This is where there is a very unique, when it comes to thinking about the void, thinking about emptiness, this is where I haven't, this was an angle I came up with, a philosophical angle, where I'm like, what if whatever we say emptiness is, it's one side of a coin. That means I saw this sort of, uh, I don't know what I should coin this as. <laughs> um, let's call it um, the universal coin paradox. The universal coin paradox, sure. I'll go with that. The universal coin paradox. Oh, oh, okay. The universal coin of emptiness. No, oh my God, no. The uh, <laughs> the double-edged, the double-edged, uh, the double-sided universal coin of emptiness. That means emptiness is a coin. Whatever we consider, there could be something else behind the emptiness, simultaneous with it. <clears throat> that means the 2D is like, oh my God, I don't see anything, and all the 3D beings are laughing. Then the 3D beings are, 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 are like, oh man, we see everything. Then the 4D beings are laughing, and then the 4D beings think they see everything, and the 5D beings are laughing, and da 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 da. -da. It just goes up as much as <clears throat> numeracy is tall, and you know, mathematics is tall. So, when it comes to the void, I would say this is the pure unknown. There has been moments where when I, I feel when I go into deep sleep, my attention goes into that dimension, goes into the zero dimension, goes into the void. So, I realize that it, as, as important as it, it is to enter rooms in this life, a person should practice exiting rooms as well. Because ultimately the attention will leave the room of and we don't know how it's gonna what's gonna happen <clears throat> after death but we know that there is a momentum to life and there's a multi-dimensional momentum and so it's really how are we treating imagination as real and uh, or let me say this way is imagination real or is reality imagined and if reality is imagined, fighting over uh, in the intellectual precision of what concept is the accurate concept to the outer realms, 
uh, is accessible but to the inner realms it's flawed that means it's as if the continental philosophers saw the analytical philosopher limiting the universal possibility only to to objects and then they were like oh my god you know look at those savages you know denying the world uh, of what is actually inspiring it to move because human beings it's like so what we measure the system we still got to live in the system and life is not always measurable and that means i'm saying it in, in ways where you cannot uh, uh, um, plan even like i can't tell you how many times i've planned for something i'm like what a waste of time if the events didn't go exactly as i planned <laughs> so i was like wow so i just planned for something that the future moved different i planned for like a different parallel universe it was like so there is something about and if we say right now we're in the linguistic simulation in this language hologram the way you get out of language so i've explained the zero one two and zero really is just pure being so that means when you pay more attention to how you're being you automatically the brain's like okay this attention in this <clears throat> governing body <clears throat> has not chosen to recreate itself and when you stop choosing to recreate itself familiar patterns in the brain become dormant like a person at the gym as if the brain is a muscle right so when you when you train <clears throat> let's say you you train the muscle it's like the muscle is active and this is why like in, in uh, those people who do a certain workout in the gym and they got to see based on their body for example they have to change the workout because their body is smart and their body gets used to the workout so it doesn't change as much <clears throat> you know the muscles um have a familiarity but let's say if somebody doesn't do something for a while then comes back like I've been pondering often where, you know, if I should go on a sabbatical. <laughs> and uh, that's the thing where there's always this question, will the engine be running the same with the same momentum? Or will the momentum completely vanish and re completely reemerge as a totally different thing, you know? And really art is, uh, I would say, art saves lives. Why? Because it is philosophical salvation. It gives a purpose and uh, it gives the known individual an unknown purpose. That is the magnificence of art. It creates when everything in time, in some sense, It's like an offering to Brahman. It's like when somebody creates something new, imagine you're offering something to Brahman. When somebody maintains something, all the managers and company, like that's an offering to Vishnu. Let's say when somebody is destructive, that is offering to Shiva. And these three archetypes are suggestions that these are dimensions and the attention has to choose where to go so that means as if a person <clears throat> can be completely um, in the outer realms in the right place but their mind might be in the wrong place you know <clears throat> or they might be in the wrong place and their mind is in the right place so they quickly get out of that wrong place two exits out of duality the singular void <clears throat> and the infinite void <clears throat> and this is why i call it ring of the absent heaven or and this this ring of the absent heaven saying there's four dimensions 
and the infinite dimension is what we haven't explored yet and so if someone experiences oneness it's like good job you'll get through life very easily but you did not do the new <clears throat> those who honor dualism that means that just because life gets tough they don't dehumanize quickly they maintain their humanity that means it's as if like you're a multi-dimensional being and just because something had changed in one dimension you're like oh my god you don't just change everything <clears throat> right so it's like noticing your space noticing you are a thing in space noticing you are two things in space and how there could be a dual universe and then noticing that there could be at the moment you have duality then you can access infinity pretty much there is no need for three four five six seven at all <clears throat> so infinity is is the ultimate of yeah, after duality it's like it, it becomes two times two times two times so that's like an infinite it, it just sparks from there the possibility of there. that's what we have not familiarized our ourselves with that means it's like the person wonders of the reverse of civilization we're temporary beings <clears throat> uh, trying to eternally continue imagine we become eternal beings who are temporarily trying to continue oh my god So eternal beings are trying to be temporary and temporary beings are trying to be eternal. <clears throat> so eternally, eternity is not necessarily the way out, but it is the way out of individual. You know, it's the way out of temporary beings seeking eternity. I would say one should, uh, people should just treat their intelligence as a gift that their whole life uh, they're slowly opening and they can choose to quickly open it but it's up to them because we're alive once there can be no teacher and student and it's a battlefield of just uh, <clears throat> unknown minds piloting known bodies in the space time this ring of the absent heaven means that from space comes matter from matter uh, the moment there's matter in space, then there's chaos and order, the possibility of duality. <clears throat> and then from duality, we go to the possibility of infinity. And this is where individual conception leaves. And if we were to wonder about what would the culture for an immortal being, for an infinite being look like, <clears throat> let's say immortal first the cultural uh, program for an immortal being it would literally be an endlessly updating alphabet of image that means it would there would be no more you know, person games that means you, that right now there, there's a reason to be human uh, humanized but if in the future um, whether we technologically become dehumanized or <clears throat> I don't know something happens behaviorally uh, our ignorance the human us. It's like we should plant the human banner very firmly on earth. So the, the whole problem of life is that people are trying to escape duality rather than being like what is this dimension about? Right? It's like we're in an uh, in the you know that's the thing. We have lost our honor of duality. And so let's say from the view of oneness, duality is the dream of oneness. And let's say infinity is the dream of duality. And oneness is the dream of the void. And the void is the dream of the inf infinite. And it keeps going, it keeps going means infinite beings are dreaming of voids voids are dreaming of in the, uh, the individual let's say you're dreaming of gods and gods are dreaming of uh, man and dual and man is dreaming of the beyond and the infinite and so life is all about studying intelligence's movement beyond 
personalization. What greater wisdom can there be? We're just creatures on a rock. We have to build something. So let's say we have an advanced civilization. This advanced civilization is seeing that every human being can contribute to the design level. That means every person that lives a life, they see something. That means our brains are strangely recording films and there's no reason for these films to, uh, to go down with the ship, you know? That's the value of the mind. So, so the mind is here where its content can be shared and um, it can also not be shared. I mean, so much of life is just silently passes by. Vivekananda says Everything is easy when you are busy, but nothing is easy when you are lazy. Swami Vivekananda says, never say no, never say I cannot, for you are infinite. All the power is within you. You can do anything. Literally, Swami Vivekananda is saying, you know, it's like God's moving your ego. You know, so if you see beyond the ego, there is there's a life that could be lived, not just based on uh, linear desire. <clears throat> Swami Vivekananda says, do not lower your goals to the level of your abilities. Instead, raise your abilities to the height of your goals. In other words, go big or go home. Swami Vivekananda says, you are incarnations of God, all of you. You are incarnations of the Almighty, Omnipresent, Divine Principle. You may laugh at me now, but the time will come when you will understand. You must. Nobody, nobody will be left behind. Swami Vivekananda says, Take risks in your life. If you win, you can lead. If you lose, you can guide. That means any person who has failed, that's feedback. Use that. <laughs> it's like at least you got you got a report from it you know you got to imagine like any time a person failed there was a printer in, in the clouds that suddenly printed a report of what happened to them and that printer paper just fell in their hands you know and they're like oh my god this is a report of my failure at least now I know <laughs> Swami Vivekananda says when I asked God for strength, he gave me difficult situations to face. When I asked God for brain and brawn, he gave me puzzles in life to solve. When I asked God for happiness, he showed me some unhappy people. When I asked God for wealth, he showed me how to work hard. <laughs> when I asked God for favors, he showed me opportunities to work hard. When I asked God for peace, he showed me how to help others. God gave me nothing I wanted. He gave me everything I needed. And remember, in a previous statement, Swami Vivekananda had said, everybody is the incarnation of God. This means 
he, when he says nothing I wanted, he gave me everything I needed, that means the universal order surpasses the chaos that man's mind fathoms that he cares, that he's asking his prayers for. That means, that means a lot of people are praying for actually an invisible problem to go away. Not realizing nature on an essence level, <clears throat> or there was this idea of the exoteric and esoteric, the exo being the uh, external appearance and the esoteric being the inner essence. The inner essence knows what the personality can never. Swami Vivekananda says the gift of knowledge is the highest gift in the world. Why? And you know why? Because when you open the gift of knowledge, you find the unknown in there. Surprise. <laughs> you know, it's like, it's like we should have like this surprise party, you know? And this is, uh, uh, he, it's, it's our species official birthday party, imagine. We're like, yeah, the species was born in the void. Let's celebrate this day. You know, even though time is our own, you know, <clears throat> paint on the canvas. Swami Vivekananda says, talk to yourself at least once in a day. Either, otherwise, you may miss a meeting with an excellent person in this world. Wow. Swami Vivekananda says, take up one idea. Make that one idea your life. Think of it. Dream of it. Live on that idea. Let the brain, muscles, nerves, every part of your body be full of that idea. And just leave every idea, other idea alone. This is the way to success. Swami Vivekananda says, <clears throat> Purity, patience, and perseverance overcome all obstacles. All great things must of necessity be slow. And this is true, I can see an example of this in Lord of the Rings 2, when the ants, when the trees get up and they were like super slow, right? And they were the most important necessity, because they were nature. <laughs> and the ants, you know, slowly with perseverance, patience, and purity, I don't know about purity, but the end, but the <laughs> But the, the trees in the Lord of the Rings destroy, you know, private property. <laughs> so Ami Bhavakaranda says, the greatest help to spiritual life is meditation. In meditation, we divest ourselves of all material conditions and feel our divine nature. We do not depend upon any external help in meditation. The touch of the soul can paint the brightest color, even in the dingiest places. It can cast a fragrance over the vilest thing. It can make the wicked divine and all enmity, all selfishness is a face. It, oh, excuse me. Uh, it can make the wicked divine and all enmity, all selfishness is a face. That means a fourth dimensional effort can make a three-dimensional and two-dimensional <clears throat> viewer be energized. So that means, like, like the, the like. <laughs> it, okay, let's say this from a non-secular standpoint. <clears throat> um, it's like the uh, m mind. It's like the body needs energy, and the body looks at the mind, and it's like, hey, can I have some energy? And the mind's like. Okay, you know, but then the mind's like, wait a minute, I need energy. And then the mind looks at the soul and it's like, can I have energy? And the soul's like, sure, I'm beyond time, you know. <laughs> I got infinite energy for you. <laughs> oh, man. I thought I was out of control. The world is out of control. <laughs> Swami Vivekananda says, true religion is not talk or doctrines or theories, nor is it sectarianism. 
it is an it is the relation between soul and God religion does not consist in erecting temples or building churches or attending public worship it is not to be found in books or in words or in lectures or in organizations religion consists in realization we must realize God feel God see God uh, talk to God that is religion I, I think what he means by the last sentence because I could see like um, you know the mouth of some atheists watering like growling like wolves you know? <laughs> I, I feel what he means here he says we must realize God feel God imagine God is the whole universe so literally he's saying if Swami Vivekananda is saying is imagine religion is realizing <clears throat> that we must realize the universe let's say truth the universal truth we must feel the universal truth we must see the universal truth and then we must talk to the universal truth what does that mean uh, excuse me what does that mean uh, we realize god that means we realize okay there's a truth in the room then we are like okay we're feeling the, 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 uh, we're seeing a deeper dimension of the truth then we actually see that deeper dimension. <clears throat> Let's say we see universal truth somehow. Somehow for a nanosecond, the person blinked and they're like, you know, in their inner realm, they were like for a second looking at as, as the whole universe at themselves. <laughs> you know? You thought you were a drop in the ocean. Now you're looking at it from the ocean and all the drops that are raindrops falling in. So, so we realize that there is a truth. Then we feel truth. That means we engage truth. Then after we, we get feedback from our engagement, we see a sort of universal finding. Uh, so something gets recalibrated. Then ultimately we communicate to the universal truth. And that is religion. So, so that would kind of mean that it's as if in, in certain... I don't know if this is um, the same in all Abrahamic texts. Um, but it's as if they say only God knows what's in your heart. And any judgment from the outer realms on your soul doesn't make sense. If there is God. If there is God, what is man doing judging man? Right? So if, if man, like for me, that this is the whole strange thing of... The religious movement having a, a blasphemy dimension in it that means it's as if it's as if like we're saying god it's all god's will <clears throat> imagine like from a religious context it's all god's will but we're saying what's god's will like what the fuck you know like it becomes it, it, it has become a situation where it's as if man is acting like god so that means who's the judge man or god who is who is judging how man understands religion, God or man. In polytheistic traditions, for example, Swami Krishnananda says religion is God remembering himself. That means we, the truth, the higher dimensions are realizing they are not us. <laughs> And imagine God, in the, just the idea of God is waiting for mankind to be like, hey, we got this, don't worry about it, you know, go to the next university. <laughs> that means pretty much, I mean, um, the idea of God, of course, it's, it's, it's the personification of the universe. <clears throat> this personification of the universe is the universe doesn't matter if we see it in, as a person or not, as a personality or as a sort of behavior to the individual. Because life will just keep going forward, you know, and if we don't see beyond it, and it's endless continuity. What else can attention do? If attention is unconditional to matter, if the mind is in a superior room than the body, 
that means if the mind keeps looking at matter all that it can do is be embodied so the, the, the whole point of the wheel of karma is that we're looking at the wheel and so if you go to the center of the wheel of karma the center of the wheel doesn't move if, if a human being centers themselves and this is what I, I would say is remembering your presence beyond your personality that force and then the person starts to realize as they become responsible for their intelligence they will realize they are the invisible other so the new age community is going to suddenly notice that there, the idea of metaphysics, the narratives we ascribe to the void may be hollow, but the experiences we have are not. And it totally makes sense why it's designed, nature is designed it this way. Let me tell you why. Because if language was as real, if the, our inner events were as real, as outer events, we would have no reason to move. So imagine, it, it would literally be like someone sitting on a couch in the future, putting this cyberspace thing on their face, and then the person <clears throat> never, like for imagine three weeks, they've never left that stop. They've literally gone into a cyberspace samadhi. Literally, that same behavior, that's what the samadhi is, that inner realm that piloting. But you'll pilot in your inner realms with the remembrance the only the only way i feel not the only way but i feel a way comfortably this can be done is if you remember yourself beyond it uh, before this self and if that self is not ideological if you remember the non-ideological when i say non-ideological that means you can't have a past life there's no storytelling anymore. it is the truth the presence of the open eyes of the universe. I'm going to read a few more quotes from Song Vikanda. He says, if you are pure, if you are strong, you, one man, are equal to the whole world. I think Swami Vivekananda is calling greatness fat here. I don't know. It could be. <laughs> Swami Vivekananda says, self-sacrifice, not self-assertion, is the law of the highest universe. And self-sacrifice means, doesn't mean you something has to be in a destructive manner gone. It means you sacrifice the inner event that was defining you for the potential of the inner events that will come. And this is so freeing. I don't know how to say it. I, I termed it as experience tunneling, but I never said it in, in the previous talks that you got to be detached from the idea of the experiencer. So really, if, if think of it this way, in the outer realms, we move as an object, so we move in known ways. Now, what if in your inner realms, you are an unknown subject and you move in unknown ways, but because we're thinking like the body, we can't understand the mind. And we're like, what's going on there? You know, and we're looking at, again, the endless sky. <laughs> Swami Vivekananda says, take up an idea. 
devote yourself to it, struggle on in patience and the sun will rise for you. That means listen to the roar of your heart of hearts. This is a moment in the lifetime, I don't know who you are, but uh, it's like a moment in your life where you suddenly, uh, all the memories, all your childhood and everything you've gone through, suddenly like a puzzle fits in, you know, and you see the work of your eyes. You start carrying on and continuing the timeless work of your eyes. That means it's not just temporary means that work. Swami Vivekananda says, do not hate anybody, because that hatred which comes out from you must, in the long run, come back to you. <clears throat> if you love, that love will come back to you, completing the circle. Swami Vivekananda says, the best thermometer to the progress of a nation is its treatment is its treatment of its women. This is kind of incredibly insane. I shouldn't say insane. I should say, at least I'm, I'm, I'm looking at it from this uncommon angle that the source of man that means pure male selfishness has to come towards the at least egoic honor of source that means it's as if how many people care for their starting point in this life So our starting point has to be not only prioritized, but guarded, you know. And I, I feel, um, uh, you know, in, in, in today's maybe, and I may be speaking, of course, as a, just one person in the universe with countless stars, but... <clears throat> it's as if mankind human beings need an activity and activities energize us and the way they energize us suggests how we make our choices now i feel something that is lost but it was important that people it's like this imagine a village okay Imagine a village back in the day and imagine there is, uh, you know, different families and it's a happy village and everybody's like a close family in the village. Everybody's helping each other survive in the village, okay? And now imagine there's a young girl in one family and a young boy in another family. They're born, okay? They're born at the same time. And let's say the young boy sees, for example, the father, you know, defending his mother okay now this young boy goes into society this is back in the day in, in a village imagine and in some sense what is what is going on is of course the events in nature and in life can happen in so many ways there's so many ways the moment can happen but for the man's psychology there is the the, the kind of guardian idea is very crucial because some there needs to be some sort of stability and so now imagine back in the day if there was something happening this uh, young boy could fight for the honor of this young girl if there was something happening you know and the young girl would honor her back but now we have come to a point where not only that sort of uh, old school like uh, you know classic honor <laughs> That, that classic honor is lost. It's becoming lost. Why? Because it is role obsession, right? Because we have thought equality means 
ideological equality, not realizing every brain is different in generating how it interprets the world. says <clears throat> fear is death fear is sin fear is hell fear is unrighteousness and fear is wrong life all the negative thoughts and ideas that are in the world have proceeded from this evil spirit of fear <sighs> yeah <laughs> Yeah, yeah, <clears throat> yeah, I can totally see how fear it makes a person um, not care for the outer realms of the other more than their own outer realm, right? Because we have the, in fear, what happens, there's the fight or flight mindset, and the fight or flight mindset is just innately selfish. <laughs> you know, it's looking, it's caring for its own survival and the other's survival, so if somebody cares for themselves more than their world they might not realize it but they might really be afraid of the world and the only way the fear is countered is by caring for the world and, a re and an inner restoration of an honor of your own life that means it's like if you've endured in this space-time continuum honor yourself but then realize that that honor truly belongs to the civilization because our individual egos that are like you know yeah, um, eating their desires like like pastry are not realizing that it's like the person will vanish and only their efforts will echo on so that's really the game to play if, if, if we're talking about the intellect it's about the continuity of the efficient systems for the future generations and ultimately the design of a backup system that um, makes our failure um, way more impossible than our success. Anyways, <clears throat> uh, thanks for listening. Uh, and I'll stay. I will be on this school for a little bit for those interested. And uh, one last thing. The inner realms require effort, and what would that effort look like? That effort would literally look like as if you were on an island. You were stranded on an island, and for a moment you thought nobody knew the mystery of your eyes. So what would be the resolution to a treasure that is within, not without? The treasures outside can have a map. But the treasures inside are, are their journeys are different. Sometimes it has to come from trusting the world before you trust yourself. Then you find a world you can trust and the self reemerges in you. You know, there's some moments where a person can notice, in, whether in the inner realms and a landscape or in the outer realms or whatever. <clears throat> in the outer realms, let's say you go on Mars, totally different landscape. Let's say now you're on Earth and you visually, you close your eyes and you just imagine if you were on Mars. <clears throat> right, so so that visualization of Mars in your inner realms, even though you're on Earth, and let's say you open your eyes and they both overlay. So you look at the soil of the Earth and you see, I mean, think about it this way, right? We treat it as, like, they, they call it like, um, frag it's like in the school of thought in psychology that studies fragmented, uh, a fragmented psyche. And so what that means is how a person's mind has been broken and why that person doesn't have an ability to rebuild it because everybody should naturally have an ability to rebuild their mind. Why? Because you have energy, you know, so that means you just need to direct your energy or uh, the, the velocity angle again, the, the direction of the speed, you just need to navigate that and it's like, 
it technically should be able to rebuild just like the body heals itself the the mind i even when it comes to subjective living should heal itself This is perhaps why Lao Tzu said action through inaction in the Tao Te Ching. When it comes to mysticism, mysticism at least that's key. So, so in the inner realms, uh, study your outer realms, be comfortable with your outer realms, accept the world honestly, find an honest world, and then begin your search. That means like find, notice what your truths are, whoever you are, like your truths about the world that you, you truly feel like that's a truth. Be honest with that and then come to like literally sit and for a moment to be like, okay, regardless of whatever I believe or disbelieve, now what? <laughs> and then from that preferencelessness, you will start noticing how your mind moves. And, and when you truly notice your mind's move, your own into your own inner realms will fascinate you. But this is very crucial that you have a discrimination between the outer realms and the inner realms. That means whatever state of mind the person goes in, it's important that be human first. That means it's too soon for the species to dehumanize into some sort of uh, collective one, collective mind. And we still need our individualism to uh, build levels to this. And uh, for me, something that has assisted me with just noticing my inner realms also is writing. I can't tell you how a habit of mine has been to just take a notebook and go sit in nature. That's it. <laughs> I just go sit in nature and I take a notebook and I just look at the world. And then I, after some point, I notice I'm looking at myself, looking at the world. And then that self, that, excuse me, that's, that self has no uh, other, that is not dual. So when, when I shift out of the observer-object relationship, I am nothingness in everything. And that nothingness in everything is like a trust in being that in, in the background has a specific context, but the person perhaps may not consciously be able to know it in this room, in this plane of existence. So I'm saying is whatever you're doing, it's like the species has to mature beyond the glorification, treating language playfully and ultimately just exploring, uh, seeing how far the eyes of the world can go. I mean, what else can I say? You know, I feel I've reached the uh, edge of uh, how reality is designed to be engaged. <laughs> that, means, that means it's like we're, we're, we're characters in a story. What can we do? We can remain a character and keep living the story. We can be a character that uh, transcends the story. You know, uh, we can carry. We can become a character that uh, we can no longer become a character, and it's just only the setting of the story. You know, and so there's endless, <laughs> endless ways of characterization. It's like massive characterization is happening behind the eyes of me. an effort to study the mind of man in that man's way, I feel that it's time to stop. Namaste.